On today's PropTech VC show, we're joined with Megan Loist. She's the founder at Gen Z VCs and an investor at Lara Hippo. Megan, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for, for having me, Zane. Uh, excited to be here. Great. So we're both venture capitalists. How did you end up where you are now? And tell us a bit about, very quickly, about Gen Z VCs. Sure. So I started at Lear Hippo actually in September of 2020, and I got my job through a cold email. So graduated from Boston College in 2019. I'm 24 years old, and I went straight into investing right out of college. So I was at General Atlantic, and there I was in a sourcing role, sending hundreds of cold emails a week to founders and building thematic deep dives. I learned that I love investing, but really wanted to be focusing on earlier stage, largely because I think at the early stage, you get to be so so ingrained with the day-to-day work of founders and really being a thought partner there. And also there's just a lot of exciting things that happen on day one of starting a business. So I shot a cold email to Andrea Hippo here at LH. Uh, I wanted to stay in New York, I'm from New York. I wanted to be able to invest in technology, FinTech, healthcare, consumer, and LH checked all of those boxes and, and more. I mean, I think one thing that I think about a lot is diversity. And as a young woman in venture, um, you don't often see multiple female partners in any given fund. And so that was something that was really important to me about LH and joining here. And so started LH September of 2020. And then the Gen Z VCs community and movement, which I started, that all kicked off in November of 2020. So I joined LH as the youngest person on our team by a factor of a decade. And, you know, at the time, it was the height of COVID, I was living with my parents. And when you're hired as a young person at a venture fund, so much of your job is being the boots on the ground, going to events, meeting founders. And I was basically just going downstairs to have dinner with my parents every night. <laughs> and so for me, I knew there had to be other people, like young people at other funds uh, that were doing the same job as me. I just didn't know them yet. And even in spite of me being the youngest person on my team, one thing that I realized was my perspective was really valuable, especially as we were thinking about next gen investment. So companies being built for Gen Z, younger founders who were my peers. And so I tweeted about it. I was like, hey, young people investing in Gen Z, who are you? I wanna meet you, compile stories, maybe write an article. And that's exactly what I did. I interviewed 70 young VCs all over the world, wrote about it in an article. It was like Gen Z VCs weigh in, top trends, favorite companies. And that was when I coined the term Gen Z VCs. The article itself totally blew up. Thousands of views, Microsoft shared it, TechCrunch shared it. And the key insight, and I think why people got so excited about it was, A, people didn't know that you know, Gen Zers were old enough to be doing investing. So that was like pretty, <laughs> pretty mind boggling for a lot of people. But on the flip side, uh, people really care what young people are doing and thinking, uh, especially in this industry like investing where, you know, young people are the kingmakers of these platforms deciding what's cool and what's not. So uh, the article blew up. I started the community on the back heels of that. Uh, we went from 30 people to a thousand in four days, 3000 a month later, and now over 13,000 and incredibly engaged. So. We have north of 200,000 messages in the Slack community, tons of initiatives run by young people. Uh, and even for me, you know, I went from someone who got my job in a cold email, was basically unqualified for my job, had 50 followers on Twitter, uh, no articles, no community, to now I'm like a thought leader around the Gen Z perspective and I'm in the press, I'm talking about the community, I'm empowering my peers through, through what we're doing. So it's been a really crazy journey for me in particular. Um, and I've created a platform where I can really elevate my peers in a, in a really profound way. So, so yeah, that's kind of the whole, the whole background and story on me, Gen Z VCs, how it all came together and my work at LH. You no, know, it's funny when I was uh, growing up and I was about 14, 15, I was lucky that my voice broke quite early. So I sounded a lot more mature. So I would call <laughs> up, I would call up all the local businesses and convince them that they need a website. And I would never ever dare to reveal my age. I would just be called yep. calling and I'd be making all this money and creating excuses why I can't meet them face to face. But you know, uh, I didn't, I, I, it certainly was easier being a male, right? And I'm glad to see a big shift in what's going on. But I, I definitely appreciate that age is just a number and is an excuse sometimes people put up and it's because they listen to that advice. You know, you're supposed to follow a certain trajectory and career path. I, I wanted to be a VC at one stage and I, uh, even VCs told me, no, you need to go to MB, you need to go to business school. You need to get operational experience. You need to do X, Y, Z before you're really in a place. I just said, screw that, I'm just gonna start a company. And you know, it was the best decision ever, right? 
But yep. you know, and, and you talked about breaking into an industry which is quite male dominated. There is no industry more male dominated than real estate. Real estate mm -hmm. stereotypically, especially in the position of partner and the position of a you know decision making, unfortunately it's very male dominated and it's pretty hard to break into what they call the old boys club. And it's somewhat also difficult racially too. It's quite heavily white male type of stereo stereotype, you know. What's going on in the metaverse? Uh, why don't we start with defining what you, how would you define the metaverse and um, all, all the associated terminology around it? Sure, so I think, uh, and sorry, there's a, something else on my window, but um, I think a lot of people, a lot of people think about the metaverse as virtual reality. And I think that is not the right or classic classification or way to think about it. And a large part of that is because of Facebook renaming to Meta, talking about virtual reality, what they're building with Horizon Worlds. And so I think a lot of people in, in, in like just in America, the, the world think, okay, the metaverse is virtual reality. We're all gonna be running around with headsets. But in reality, the definition is much broader than that. Virtual reality is certainly a subset. Um, the way that I think about the, the metaverse is it's really a virtual world where people can socialize, work, shop, and play. Um, and the three sort of categories within that are virtual reality, like Meta, but also augmented reality, which is similar to Pokemon Go, for example, or more traditional virtual worlds like Roblox, for example. And so I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of games, traditional games, as being metaverses, but that was kind of the introduction to the metaverse for so many people, especially Gen Zers like me. I grew up playing Club Penguin and Webkins, and when you think about the actual mechanics of how that works, you have a digital avatar that is running around the world, like a, a, a virtual world. There is an in-game ecosystem of, of sort of money and digital currency. You're building a home, you're building friendships, you're connecting with people. Uh, the metaverse is today, are I think built in a much much more scalable way to think about creating actual monetization opportunities for people and and property owners, right? Like in the crypto world. Uh, but the idea and the concept of the metaverse has kind of existed for a long time. It's just when you think about the metaverse today versus the metaverse in 20 years, there's just different ways to think about it. And Megan, you, you published a piece that went quite viral and when we talked about sending cold emails, I sent you a cold email saying, I, I love yeah. this piece, I shot it out to my network. Um, it, it was one of the first pieces online that really defined for people, the layman, what's going on in the industry. Now, there's been a lot of interest in the space, and I'm trying to ascertain, is this speculation? There's a lot of people coming in, driving up prices, seeing Meta rebrand, and then there's other people that are, you know, legitimately trying to build a, an ecosystem. Right now, there's a lot of hype. Do, do you agree with that? There is a lot of hype, but it's warranted, right? I think I, I saw a tweet yesterday, which I think was very telling. and. The intersection of NFTs and the metaverse are very intertwined. Like many, many metaverse, many like, when you think about the future of the metaverse, many people are gonna be able to use their NFTs as avatars to roam around virtual worlds. Or that's the hope, right? With the idea and concept of an open metaverse. Mutant Ape Yacht Club and Board Ape Yacht Club in January did more sales on OpenSea than the global box office did for the entire ent entertainment industry. You can call that hype, but there is fact and data that is backing up a lot of this, right? Where it's like, this is kind of the future of entertainment. It's the future of culture. And that's why my article I think did, did blow up and go and, and, and blow up. It's because I focused on the cultural aspects of the metaverse and how people are engaging with culture and brands, which at the end of the day is like what the metaverse, like what, what actually matters here, right? It's like my 46 or like my 50 year old aunt texting me being like, I get it now. I love Prada. I love Gucci. I love Dolce & Gabbana. I want to be a part of this. Like people's introduction to the metaverse will oftentimes be through these cultural moments versus just, oh, I've heard of Roblox. That sounds interesting. I'm going to play. It's like, no, someone's holding a concert in the metaverse that you love. Uh, it's going to be driven by fandom. And a lot of that is through existing communities, brands, new NFT projects, etc. Sounds to me like you're saying metaverse is more than just gaming because that's the impression a lot of people have of these virtual environments where you can navigate with your avatar. And, and they see their children playing Roblox and, and you know other people playing Fortnite or Minecraft or, or you know Second Life. What's going on here? Is, is it gaming at its core or do you feel like gaming is only a subset? I mean, game, like you have to have the gaming mechanics to keep people engaged. There's like, the, there are two ways to think about it. It's like you come for the games because they're fun and you're enjoying your time, or you come from the social and cultural aspects of things. So if I am going to 
Fortnite, it will probably be because Ariana Grande is hosting a concert. I won't stay for the games, right? But there are people that go to Fortnite because they just love the game. Their friends are playing the game. And so like people go to different metaverses for different reasons. And this is also a big believer why I don't think there will be just one metaverse that wins and takes over the industry. People might appreciate the UI and functionality of Microsoft Mesh for work, work case, like for work use cases, right? Or they may after work, they want to like put on their Oculus headset and hang around in Horizon Worlds because their friends are there. Uh, there's going to be different use cases for different aspects of the metaverse. Uh, so that's kind of how I think about that.